The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Summer music festivals are back. So to celebrate all this July, the Agenda in the Summer revisits conversations with a diverse cast of musicians and music experts. Tonight, Danny Michelle from 2017. Musician Danny Michelle has described it as a cross between the Millennium Falcon and the Grand Budapest Hotel. In fact, it was an unforgettable journey through the high Arctic on a famed Soviet icebreaker with a collection of artists, scientists, and one very well-known Canadian astronaut. Danny Michelle joins us now to tell us about his experience and the album that came out of it, Klebnikov. Welcome, Danny. Hi, how are you? It's really great to have you here. It's great to be here. How did you get involved in this expedition? Um, well, I, I was the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, Evan and Chris Hadfield, Ev Chris and his son, uh, gave me a call. And, they... and Chris Hadfield is the famous yeah. astronaut. <laughs> He's on the back of our $5 bill. Yeah. Um, uh, they called me and said, you know, would you ever be interested? We're thinking we're maybe doing this trip. Would they have your number? Y yeah. That's awesome. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and they said, would you be interested in going to the Arctic? Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, yeah, I was like, of course, let me just cancel everything I was doing before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they invited me and had this idea to to take a bunch of artists up to the Arctic. And uh, so it was, I would, like I said, I was the luckiest guy in the world. Um, I want to show viewers what it was like, but I want to ask you first, you were on it for 18 days, the icebreaker? Yeah. How did your life change in those 18 days? What could you not do there that you could do in your everyday life? Well, my life changed by going to this little corner of our planet that most people never get to see that was just life-changing and beyond words that I could describe how beautiful it was. Um, our life changed in, in other small ways, like we were, we had no communication with, the, we were at the top of the planet, you know? We, the planet comes here, we were like right at the top and, and we had no, uh, there's no cell coverage, there's no internet, nothing for 18 days, which is a long time, 18 days to be completely out of touch with your family. And, you know, um, so that was, that was a, a neat adjustment too. Well, let's give yours a look at the icebreaker you called home for 18 days. Yeah. Here's the footage you took of the beast. Let's take a look. That looks like something out of a movie. That, like, like it's fake, but you live that. Yeah, and when you yeah for 18 days, you kind of it's a bizarre thing that happens where you kind of get used to it, and that's what was really weird. That you know after a while, it kind of became normal. You say that the Klebnikov is a cross between a giant floating Grand Budapest Hotel and the Millennium Falcon. Why? <laughs> yeah, well, it's just this. Oh, it's hard to explain. It's just this like, intense. Beat up, not beat up. It's in great shape, but it's like it's it's old and sturdy, sturdy, and like oh, so everything's got these giant knobs and dials that are like you know from from the old days, and and uh, it's just this wild machine, just you know crushing through through this harsh environment, and at the same time, then you go inside and and it's all these little hallways and 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 and, and corridors and little tiny rooms, and it, to me, we all got on it, and I just thought you know. It looked like a Wes Anderson movie. Ever, like I thought, Wes Anderson has to just come film a movie on this boat. Um, it, it was just a really, it's a really visually mm -hmm. cool thing to see. What are some of the, shi oh, the ship's features? Oh, there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, a sauna and a, there's a swimming pool uh -huh. that we never there's went in. There's a swimming pool? Yeah, there's a swimming pool. We never went in it because they, it was only kind of maybe the size of two of these little platforms we're sitting on. Okay. And they would... Every now and then, it would be it, the water was the bottom of the pool was I think painted black, so you could never 
you couldn't really see in how deep it was. <laughs> and then all of a sudden one day there'd be no water in it. And then there'd be water in it again and they would suck the water in and out of the ocean. So it was ocean water and it would be just freezing cold. And I, the Russians, I believe, they would plunge, just do a, jump, a dunk in it uh -huh. and then run in the, in the sauna. And they kind of used it more as like a dunk tank. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. What else was on the ship? Oh, there was, uh, there was a helicopter pad at the back with two helicopters, uh, six Zodiac boats. Uh -huh. yeah, it had a pretty great, you know, they called it the toy box. Um, so we were out every day going on adventures in these old choppers mm -hmm. and, uh, and boats. And you, and you actually descended into the metal uh, bowls of that 24,000 horsepower ship? Yeah. To explore where it got its power. What did you find? It took, it took me 18 24, days. 24,000? 24,000 horsepower, this thing. And it took me 18 days to befriend the right <laughs> Russians with broken English and not being able to speak to befriend them to try to let me to come down and see uh -huh. the engine room that went down four flights of engines. And uh, it's on that show there. Uh -huh. I give a tour of it. And it's just... It's insanity. What it was, was the, mo the most awe-inspiring moment for you? Oh, I remember there was a w one moment that I'll never forget. It was yeah. about four in the morning and I was in bed and you have your normal like feeling of being on a boat, right? But then this had, as it's hitting the ice, you have a constant like, uh -huh. <laughs> like it's like, you feel like bang, hitting, hitting something. And it was really, you know, hitting hard one night and I thought, I gotta get up and see what this, I, I gotta see what is going on because obviously we're going through some big ice. And so at four in the morning, I get up and the sun's out because uh -huh. it's bright and I put on all my gear and I go stand, I just stood at the front of the boat, right at the bow, like, like in Titanic. And just, I was alone just seeing this sight that was like pieces of ice the size of tennis courts, just bouncing around, flipping, and it was, it was just hard for my, it's hard for your brain yeah. to actually like calculate what you're looking at because it's, you've never seen anything like this. And when I saw that footage. It was so beautiful. Like it was an incredible and yeah. I guess the, uh, the beauty um, outweighs the fear you would have because I saw the footage and I was like, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And in 2009, the Klebnikov was trapped in Antarctic sea ice. It got trapped in the ice. Yeah. yeah. Were you ever afraid that that something like that would happen to you? No, I mean, at first there was, there, it was, I guess it, at all times it was, there was danger. I mean, we would be in these little Zodiac boats in the water um, around the icebergs and, and uh, you know, if you were in that water for more than four minutes, you, you're done. And, and then we're in these old helicopters going over the glaciers and I was like, they all kind of, you look at them and you think, oh, I hope these things make it. But, you know, I kind of kept my eye on, on Chris Hadfield, uh -huh. and I thought, well, if he's if, he, if he's not worried, he's one of the greatest pilots in the world. And he's been to space, so yeah. And I mean, yeah, he's a jet fighter pilot. Yeah. He, he knows this stuff. Uh -huh. So if he's not if he's going, I'm going. And uh, and then I just gave up being scared and thought, if, if it's my time to go, it's my time to go. <laughs> well, what a way to go, right? Yeah, um. I'm not gonna yeah, I'm not gonna like miss these opportunities yeah. because I'm afraid. You know? Here's the route that you took um, from Ottawa to Greenland to Nunavut. You spent 18 days aboard the Captain uh, Klebnikov, even traveling through the Northwest Passage. Yeah. You have said it was the closest thing I can imagine to leaving the planet. Paint us a picture of what it looks like up there. Oh, it was changing all the time. Greenland was just gorgeous. We were in our t-shirts mm -hmm. for part of it. Um, and then we get up um, through all the fjords. We, I mean, we stopped at the Franklin graves of the grave sites of the Franklin expedition and wow, is that ever, you know, humbling and mm -hmm. amazing. And what happened there? Um, well, the, were the first, the first explorers that, mm -hmm. that found this route, you know, didn't make it mm -hmm. and uh, their graves are all there. And, um, and right up uh, above 80 degrees and uh, into just like these pieces of, you know, uh, ice that are like the size of the Grand Canyon. And uh, it's hard to explain. It's, re it's really hard for me to explain, but it just Im immense, stunning beauty that I'd never seen before. Did you see any signs of uh, effects of climate change? Yeah, I mean, I'm certainly not qualified to speak technically on climate change, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I can tell you we, we saw glaciers that had receded co like kilometers in the last you know, f year, few years that you know, over that had to, you know, that before had uh, taken 
hundreds of years to move mm -hmm. something that far. So yeah, at, but at the same time, um, we saw lots. We saw polar bears, and they were all, you know, big and chubby and healthy, and they were doing good. So that was really beautiful to see. Let's show, um, show a clip of that. Yeah. yeah. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? What was it like to that see was, a polar that bear? That was the most beautiful moment ever. Mm -hmm. the, the cool thing about that um, is we were in that in that in that spot. We were in an area where they said only submarines could normally go. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that that we were probably the first human beings that bear has ever seen, which was kind of hard. <laughs> it's an interesting thing to think about. Like we're looking at each other for the first time. I never seen a polar bear. He'd never seen a human being. And You're sizing uh, each other up. Yeah, well, what a powerful moment. And, he's, and he was just over the bow of the boat, and like you could just hear him <laughs> sniffing and looking at us. It was like, ooh, there's another scary moment. You, you know? were able to leave the ship. Where did you go? Well, we not alone. You weren't able to leave the ship. Uh -huh. We'd go out every day. We'd go on excursions. Uh, we would fly to glaciers, um, you know, to small communities, mm -hmm. and um, we'd take zodiacs out around the icebergs, and yeah. And you met some locals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots Who were of, they? Oh, just wonderful people everywhere we went. You yeah. know, um, fishermen, little communities. We went, and it was just beautiful. And some, um, you met hunters, like people who probably have been living the same life there like they did 500 years ago. Yeah, yeah. we we were uh, in places where, you know, someone, this man had just like caught a narwhal. What is that? Uh, a whale. It's a type of whale, right? The, whale, the one with the, the thing? Yeah, the unicorn of the sea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, and he just had, you know, hunted him and he was, you know, feeding all the sled dogs and his family. And, uh -huh. It's an incredible moment because, yeah, they're living exactly like they, human beings lived hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Nothing's changed for them. And you recorded your album yeah. in your tiny cabin. Yeah. Uh, Room 712. I was going to call it Studio 712. Yeah, studio. <laughs> uh, yeah, studio 712. And it was like the size of an airplane bathroom, right? Oh, it was so tiny. It's yeah. like, it's kind of like, it's the, and you have two people in there. You have a bunk mate and you're in like, it's kind of like, you know, have you ever been in a motor home where like the, the, the bathroom is also the shower, you know, <laughs> like, you know, you stand by the toilet in the, in the shower, it's all one room. It's kind of like that Okay. in the bathroom. And then these two little bunks and it was pretty tiny. Um, uh, I want to show the viewers what it looked like. And then we want I want to yeah. talk more about the album. Let's take a look. So this is our cabin. I built a recording studio out of uh, some hair ties, some elastics, um, your, uh, your camera tripod, thank you. I, I am making a record in here. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to make music? <laughs> You're remembering the trials, I, I'm, I'm assuming. Why are you laughing? Oh, I'm just laughing at me. <laughs> what was it like to make music in such a small space? Um, it's actually... Very much like being in a recording studio. You know, uh -huh. there's many times you're in a studio and you get put in a little booth, right? Mm -hmm. You go in the little isolation booth to record. So it, it was fine. I was create, you know, using like bathrobes to like make sound baffling. Yeah. And uh, I actually got a pretty decent recording. Once I got in that room and shut the porthole and yeah. and it was very quiet actually. Yeah. And you had to, because of, of weight requirements, you couldn't yeah. take like traditional studio recording no. uh, equipment in there. No. How did you? Make the, like what did you take? How did you? Create yeah, like a for instance, I couldn't bring mic stands cause because they're, they're so heavy, heavy yeah. right? So I was using camera tripods, and the girl next door lent me her hair ties to like tie up, the, hold the microphones on, and so I had two microphones, two good microphones that were like this big, and and I ran it through my laptop and stuff, and and the recording came out pretty decent, you know, looking uh -huh. at it that way. But you also have like music that has uh, brass and strings. Did you cram those into your cabin? No. So when we were when I was on the ship, I recorded all the guitar and, and my voice. Mm -hmm. So just kind of like a campfire versions. And then we brought those recordings back to Toronto. And then my friend Rob Carley, who does uh, film and film score and orchestration, he uh, added strings and brass and wrote arrangements to them also. So now it's much more beautiful sounding. Um, you mentioned a bathrobe. Is that what you use to like contain sounds? Yeah. To drown out sounds? How did you come up with that idea? Well, you just need soft material, yeah. right? You want, yeah. you want to get away from hard surfaces where sound reflects and bounces off. So, towels. Yeah. Are the sounds of the ship on the record? Yeah, yeah. I recorded, um, I was always recording stuff with my phone. You know, people talking, dog, sled dogs barking, 
the the, the ocean, the walk, ice crushing, it's all in there. And so uh, my uh, field recordings are, are a part of the record too. Now, how many musicians have recorded that north? <laughs> I Is think, it just you? I hope. I think so. I, we we're trying to check on the, in the Guinness Book of World Records. Could it could be the most northern record ever made, uh -huh. above eighty degrees? Um, I don't imagine. I bet it's definitely the first ever to be done on a Russian icebreaker. <laughs> well, I know this idea came because uh, Chris Hadfield wanted to get a bunch of artists to experience um, that opportunity and then to create whatever moved them. Yeah. Um, when it was happening, did you realize how special it would be or how unique of an experience it would be? Uh, I knew that I was in involved in something really special. It took a while for it all to sink in. I didn't even take my guitar out of the case for the first week or so. Um, I just got there and started absorbing it and like changing my life, like letting letting all my business affairs and stuff and my life, addi you know, addicted to computers and machines go away and I just started like living a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and then the song slowly started coming. How, what was the process like? Did you write the lyrics first or did you make the music first or did you spontaneous? Uh, kind of. Some, some one way, some the other way, mm -hmm. some at the same time. They're all different. Um, the Russian crew, that that man, uh, the mighty Kalebnikov. Uh, how did you get along with them? Great. Yeah. Uh, the Russian. A lot of drinking. Uh, <laughs> no, some, some. <laughs> the Russian people on the ship were just beautiful people. They're mm -hmm. wonderful people, you know. And in, in in today today's world, with everything going on in politics and everything, you know, mm -hmm. don't let politics, you know, confuse you with. You know, the, the beautiful people of a country somewhere. You know, they're such great people. And um, we had so many fun times. There was some good times. I got invited into a, into a, for a birthday party mm -hmm. of a man named uh, Vladimir, who was 58. And, and uh, I kind of befriended a few guys who worked in the kitchen. And mm -hmm. then I was kind of in. And then I got, went down to the party. And in the, in the, it was just like in the hull of the boat. Mm -hmm. And they're all dancing to a ghetto blaster of like music I'd never heard. Mm -hmm. I've never heard before in my life. And, um, and they were eating reindeer and octopus and sardines and dancing, and I had a, it was a it was a, a night I'll never forget. You featured some of them on the album. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two of the dishwashers on the ship um, would sit around in the bar in the lounge one night when me and Chris were playing guitar and singing, mm -hmm. and then they started singing Russian songs to us. These two young guys, and then uh, I convinced them that they should sing on my record, and so. They came into Studio 712. <laughs> it's great, right? Yeah. It is, yeah. After after a few late night uh, vodkas, maybe, and we got in there. And we were, well, we, when you when you're singing, you have to, you yeah. know. <laughs> and we recorded some songs with them, and uh -huh. they're they're on the record, and yeah, it's it was a real blast. Oh, we have some footage of that. Um, oh, let's you take a do. Look of, yeah, let's take a look at some of the fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so Chris speaks fluent Russian, and so uh, he was the perfect translator between uh, those young guys and, and me, uh, yeah. explaining what all the lyrics mean, and yeah. Now, after spending so much time in such a small space, what did you run? What did you learn about Russian culture that you didn't know before? Oh, I mean, I learned a few little, uh, a little, a little Russian myself, but not enough to like get oh, that's by. That's fantastic. And um, just wonderful people, really kind people that that you know want you know that are just like us, want the same things we all want, and uh, yeah. That footage you just showed. Uh, what were they? What were you singing about? Uh, funny enough, those those young guys, uh -huh. like they're these like 19 year old tattooed dudes who work in the kitchen, and you'd think, you know, w when they start singing, when Chris explained to me what they're singing about, they're singing these the songs they choose to sing that they love singing are these old traditional Russian songs, and they're singing the lyrics are about uh, about riding their horse across the, the the beautiful land of Russia and all the, the the flowing streams and the sunset and all this like beautiful poetic stuff, which I was like, 
I know. It's like, it, it's it, yeah, 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 like I, I, that, looking at these guys, I'm like, that's not what I would have guessed you were singing about. And that's what was really cool about them. They were so, their songs were like how proud they were of Russia. Yeah. Who did you dedicate the album to? Yeah, kind of many things. I mean, I just kind of dedicated it to all the people I met along the way mm -hmm. and the crew of the ship, um, all the communities, the people we met. But, you know, I mostly, I mean, the ship, I really kind of fell for that ship. I, it's funny, it's just a thing, right? Uh -huh. It's a machine. But it, it, to me, it was more than that. It was like, it, it had a beautiful life to it of its own with, with the crew and stuff. And yeah, I would go back in a second. Really? Yeah. To, to, Even to without internet or access no, to all our... That was kind of the best part. Really? After a week. Why? <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, the first week was kind of tough. You, I find you find yourself looking at your phone and mm -hmm. then going and going, oh, well, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes a camera at that point. And, uh, and in a, after about a week, that kind of went away. And I just felt more present. I felt like I was having real conversations. I was in the moment and uh, I wasn't distracted. And, and that was a really nice thing. And we all agreed on that. We all felt the same way. And we all thought, um, you know, when we get home, mm -hmm we kind of didn't want to go turn them on again and uh and we all kind of promised you know we're going to change our habits the way we use it and uh, it's been hard to not get sucked back into the way the world works with all that stuff so you would say it was a life-changing experience yeah the whole for sure now that you're back down south what do you feel uh mm. generator arctic was able to accomplish uh well i i i would say that that we were able to um come back and share this special little corner of the planet that not many people get to see mm -hmm. with, with people in, in, a, in a pretty big way. Um, videographer Ben Brown, um, on the, uh, who was on the trip, who has like millions of followers online, he's created these beautiful videos. He was at the Toronto Film Festival. Um, photographers from Italy, from New York, uh, a science guy from, from um, England. We've Everyone has taken and I made a record. We all mm -hmm. took this experience and turned it into stuff and just have like pushed it out into the world. And uh, I think between us all, we've reached a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully uh, it's beautiful to share that. It, going up there and having that personal experience by yourself and then coming back and just like kind of keeping that to yourself is, mm -hmm. I don't know, it, it's your kind of duty if you get to do something like that to share it with people. I mean. It's the same with Chris being when he was on the space station. He would make all those great videos mm -hmm. and show everybody how, how, how does the toilet work in space? How do you brush your teeth? How do you sleep? How do you do everything in space? And to me, that was, like I said, it's, it's kind of like you, you have an experience like that. You got to share it with everybody. Mm -hmm. So um, he definitely is an inspiring guy and he inspired us all to, to follow in his footsteps with that. This is something that I didn't know. Um, something like 90% of Canadians live within 160 kilometers of the U.S. border. Um, what don't we understand about our Arctic? It's just so immense. If you get out a map and start really looking at how big Ontario is and then how big the Arctic is, and, and it's, it's hard to get your head around. And I think global warming for people in the world is hard for people like, you know, the debate, you know, if you believe in it or not. Mm -hmm. um, the debate about it is I can understand why people don't understand because we're talking about something it's like debating stuff that happens on the moon mm -hmm. like people don't if everyone got to go there and travel there you know obviously their views would change and they would but it, it's so foreign to us mm -hmm. and people are so unqualified and uneducated about it to talk about it it's, it's hard to like argue it you mm -hmm. know but um we got to do the best we can do, right? But now with this project, like you said, it's yeah. going to reach a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you released this album earlier this year. You performed it with a chamber or orchestra in Toronto in February. Yeah. Where are you taking it next? Um, in July, we're doing it um, in Ottawa with mm -hmm. the symphony. Uh, mm -hmm. In Vancouver, we're doing it with symphony. And there's some other things in, in the go. So this is something I never dreamed of. I mean, I'm a, a folky singer-songwriter, and so the idea that I was going to try to make a, a, a classical-based record, and then it would turn out that I'm playing it with symphonies and Chris Hadfield. It's like... It, it's mind-blown, yeah, right? It's like, it's like, okay. This, we'll is this down. my life? Yeah, this is my life right now. Yeah. Cool. It's pretty fantastic. Oh, I want to show you making some music. 
Okay. Let's take a look. Nobody rules you. watching that um that was a great moment because that was filmed that was completely unplanned it's really cold you can hear the guitars out of tune in the cold um one of the passengers on the ship walked up to me and said have you looked out, out the back of the ship right now mm -hmm. how beautiful it is right now and, and uh, he said why are you not you should film a video right now up there and i was like why well, I, I i wasn't ready to film a video and he goes just quick grab your guitar and sing a song just sing a song any song you got to get this moment. Uh -huh. And uh, I got to thank him for that. A guy named Tango. Aaron Tango talked me into that. And uh, he filmed it. Just That's just the audio of his camera. So it's really a little rough, but. No, it's, it sounds fantastic. It's what a moment. It's, it's beautiful to watch. Yeah. And I look back and I'm like, wow, yeah. that was beautiful. Well, it's really yeah. nice talking to you. Thank and you. It's great to talk what, to you. I mean, I, I have so many more questions to ask you. I just think it's such a, if all of us could get that opportunity to see it firsthand maybe we would take care of the planet a bit better. Who yeah. knows, right? Yeah. Danny Michelle, great music. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's great to see you again. Thank <laughs> nice you. Nice to see you. Coming up on the agenda in the summer. I could kind of feel something, you know, like I, I could feel the momentum building. Like I didn't know it would just start with, um, you know, one woman who happened to just kind of say like, hey, if it's happened to you, hashtag me too. But I, I could just feel the momentum. And for me, that was a wave that I rode. That, that movement, the Me Too movement, was the wind beneath my wings. And I knew that whatever this movement was, it was going to bring about great healing because that was a very big part of my journey. That's why I wanted justice. I, I wanted healing. I wanted closure. I was going to ride that train all the way to the end. And that is tonight's Agenda in the Summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO. And for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.